Greetings, everyone. I'm Father Justin Waltz. And I'm Father Jaden Nelson. We're two priests and a, and a bottle, bottle of wine. wine. We've got some very special guests here with us. We are at the Cathedral Rectory in the Diocese of Bismarck on a very special day in which one of our own, uh, presently Father Austin Vetter, sitting to my left, uh, is now Bishop-elect Vetter of the Diocese of Helena. We'll be talking a little bit more later in the show on the process of being selected bishop and becoming bishop and his thoughts. Uh, as he says farewell to Bismarck and hello to Helena. Also sitting over to my left is Monsignor Pat Schumacher. Welcome. Uh, Monsignor is the pastor of St. Wenceslas and Dickinson and the head of uh, Catholic faith formation or ongoing faith formation uh, for Catholic priests in the Diocese of Bismarck. It's a pleasure to have both of you here uh, on this very special day in which uh, we have uh, Father Vetter's final farewell uh, as us priests of the diocese say goodbye to him. We are also featuring a wine that we have yet to feature, and a wine that uh, I know very little about, and so I'm going to turn it over to Father Jaden Nelson and Monsignor Schumacher uh, to discuss this port that we have for you today. Great. All right, well, you know, late fall, winter, fireplaces to me means port fortified wine. There you go. And this is the product uh, that we're showing today. It's tradition. Uh, we're coming to you from North Dakota. This comes from our neighbors to the south in Rapid City. This is from the Firehouse Winery in Rapid City, uh, of which I'm a member, uh, which is the only way to get this wine. This is made exclusive to the Firehouse Winery members. So first I want to talk about the grape we're using and then a little bit about pork. Can we talk a little bit about the Firehouse Winery? I mean, yes. so is this a, how did you find this place? I uh, know friends with cabins down there and I visited and I also ride my motorcycle down there. And I stopped at the Firehouse Brewery because of my okay. like for local beers. Yeah. Right next to it is a Firehouse Winery. And they grow the grapes there? The, the grapes are grown south wow. of Rapid City. Wow. It is a self-sustained winery. Awesome. And I, and I highly recommend a visit. There's a restaurant to in there but uh, I went there for the craft beer but fell in love with the wine wonderful wonderful yeah it's I, you know I don't think we realize that there are grapes grown even in the Midwest really I mean Texas is kind of taking off and you know about the coasts but uh, to have a, a winery so close in the Midwest North Dakota is merging into this uh, field but it, I don't know of anything that is really uh, you know on the on the market uh, kind of spotlight right now, but this is clearly a the first a thing you need is a, is a grape for the Upper Midwest. Okay, and so this is featured with the Marquette grape. Uh, mm -hmm. This grape was developed by the University of Minnesota in 2006. Mm -hmm. It's a hybrid for okay. colder weathers and our climate up north. So they they, they literally they created it. They created it. It's a, it's a hybrid. Marquette. Mm -hmm. is the grape itself is named after Father Peter Marquette, a 17th century Jesuit, Beautiful. whom the university believes has ties to vintage wines. Once again, well, everyone, as we've said numerous times in the show, almost everything that's worth anything in this world can be traced back to, to the Catholic Church. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so, so this grape literally was planted from Vermont to Washington, and these vineyards now, since 2006, are mature. And so you have, with our sun and our cold nights, a very complex grape, a very intense grape. Oh. And so that, that's the grape, the Marquette grape. Uh, don't confuse it with Concord, which is very popular in our area too. Yeah. We had Concord grapes in our backyard growing up for jams uh, and, and wine as well. But the Marquette grape is a, is a, it's a very, very intense grape. Do you know what they use to cross to bring this hybrid? The use? University of Minnesota uses, uh, it's a complex system. Okay, so uh, it's not just a matter of like, you know, bringing in a couple. No, no, it's, okay. it's a verifiable, it's a verifiable system where what they, their hybrid was effective for these northern climates. All I right. think this is going to be very interesting to a lot of our viewers because we know a lot about genetic, genetic modifications of grains and those kinds of things yeast. up here. Yeast. Yeast. And, uh, and as we talk about this, you know, to, an emerging market might be, you know, grapes and, and wine in the Midwest. That would exactly. be interesting. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Thanks for that. So we, so we have the Marquette grape, okay? And now, now we're going to have a port fortified wine. And what, what I, well, I say port fortified, port style. Because port wine is from Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, northern Porto. Portugal, and and so and so we we create it uh, here outside of Portugal by 
by you know uh, putting brandy into it. It's fortified with brandy. So port port is wine fortified with brandy. And how did all this come about? Th this came about in that 17th century, that same time actually where Father Marquette was named after. I have a hard time putting that. I, 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 I know. So, so Great Britain had, a, has, had as a source for, for wines France. They had a political falling out and so they sourced Portugal for their wines. And, and the Portuguese, to get the wine to Great Britain uh, w without it spoiling, had to fortify it with more alcohol. Just like the IPA story, exactly. kind of, the, the Imperial yeah. India Pale Ale. Very interesting. So, so port is a, is a wine that's fortified with brandy. And this marks... That's why it's so strong, too. Exactly. We were talking before we started. It's and, 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 re and remember, brandy is a proof. wine. 41 proof. 41 proof. And, and this, this, uh, this uh, brandy in this uh, Marquette wine is from the Syrah grape. Oh, there we go. Uh, that, that, they, that they fortify with it. Okay. All right, so you have here that this is about 8% sugar. As I said, it's 41% proof. It's 20.5% alcohol. Uh, and your normal wines are around 11 and 12. So it's fortified. Uh, this is not a tawny now. This is a ruby port. The mm. tawnies are kept in the barrels longer for more amber color. Mm -hmm. And this is only finished for two years in French oak barrels. Beautiful. All right, so... Well, before we start, why don't we begin with a prayer and then we'll have a toast. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of wine, for the gift of this show. We thank you for the gift of Bishop-elect Vetter as he heads to Helena. We ask for many blessings upon his ministry there. We most especially pray for all those watching who may be hurting in any way, entrusting their healing and their consolation to the Blessed Virgin Mary as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So let's toast. Uh, this is the tradition from the Fireside Winery in Rapid City, South Dakota, a port-style wine. To Bishop Alec Vetter. To Bishop Alec Vetter. Salute. 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 Thank you. You never drink to yourself. Mm -mm. Some people drink by themselves, but that's a different thing. What do you think? That is a delicious wine. Brandy. Yeah. Black cherry. <laughs> yeah. The apricot, of, I got apricot like right away. Black, black chocolate. Black cherry and chocolate. Yep. Rocketing yep. through yep. this yep. thing, you can't believe. But most of the wines that we have or have had on this show. Uh, you know, there's maybe a lot more aroma coming off it, but this one is hitting you much harder. Mm. Uh, so it's not quite like drinking a glass of scotch or brandy, I wouldn't say, but it is, it's, it's, it's like a mix kind of of the two, but it really is got medicinal. an upfront punch. It yeah, does. It's medicinal, and as you can tell, my voice is a little hoarse, so I need a... Yeah, all the the black cherry, delicious. And I may have this a little mm. too chilled. The ruby port I should be at about 60 degrees. Your tawny should be a little cooler. But I threw this in the back of my truck driving out. Mm -hmm. And it could be a little, uh, maybe it's I a little like, too cool. I like the temp. And when, when it do. warms up, maybe it opens up a little more. But a I very think nice port some of, those, some of those heavier wines, a lot of the times, port included, and I don't drink a lot of port, but they, they're served too warm. You know, mm -hmm. and just so everybody knows, this is, you know, as we have a fire here in the background, kind of a fireside winter wine, as Monsignor said at the beginning, but it would also be mm -hmm. a, a great digestivo and after dinner drink in many different cultures uh, throughout the world, it kind of finishes, kind of finishes everything off. So, we talk about pepper? Is, uh, I, yeah, I'm feeling pepper, pepper for sure. Pepper on the finish, yeah. But we're going to score this later as we always do. Uh, if you notice something as we're going through, though, you can throw that out there. Sometimes these open track up maybe and, yeah, a little bit absolutely. more, and we can talk about this wine in just a little bit. But uh, Fireside Brewery? Fireside, fireside Winery. Winery. And there's a Fireside Brewery as well. So, Rapid City, these Marquette grapes are sourced right out of uh, south of Rapid City. It's just the Marquette quite grape. amazing that it's in the, in, in the Dakotas that we're trying such a lovely wine from the Dakotas. Mm -hmm. But moving into the Episcopacy. Uh, lots going on in the church every day in the church's life uh, and that there is uh, a whole process to almost everything that happens as we've talked about before seminary formation uh, but also in the selection of a bishop. Uh, so Bishop-elect Vetter, uh, Bishop-elect Austin Vetter is here at the rectory of the cathedral having been chosen uh, for Helena. Maybe you could just start with telling us 
how the process within the Catholic Church works uh, in being selected as a bishop. <clears throat> well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's nice to have you here. Pleasure. Congratulations. What a pleasure. Nice to have you here. <laughs> well, the process, I'm learning more about it as we go. Obviously, it's not a job interview. Uh, you're not even aware that the vetting is going on. I just had seen, actually, our own bishop saying that he first proposed me in 2013. So it's been a while, and so you can see how long the process takes. Um, but it, it stays uh, local, regional. Uh, and so hmm. North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota is under one archdiocese, and when those groups of bishops get together, one of the responsibilities they have is for every three years to propose to the nuncio, the Pope's representative in the United States, uh, a list of three candidates of priests that they agree on uh, would be possible good candidates right. to be raised to the episcopacy. And so that list of names then goes to the nuncio. And again, it's, it's uh, what they're, they're not trying to find out if the priest is no good. Right. They're just seeing, uh, do they have the qualities that it would, would be needed uh, for a bishop? And so uh, all the gathering of the information is completely confidential. I'm not aware of it. Uh, the people who receive the inquiries about me uh, are under what's called the pontifical secret. Could so you that, speak a little yeah, what is that? What do you mean by so that? basically, it's not that it's the pontifical secret allows freedom to take place, so that there's no outside influence, mm -hmm. so that those who are asked about the priest uh, are kept secret, so that all that information can be gathered, and that his reputation can be uh, not tarnished yeah, in the process, but also truly known but also truly known. So it would be, it's not confessional. Right. But it would be when you get the questions about me, that you're to answer them, right? Yep. Completely honest. Is there a penalty? Not worrying that I'm going to find out. I mean, is there some sort of teeth to that secret? Yeah, or is it just like, it. we really would appreciate it if you would keep this hush yeah. hush, or is it like, you know, you have to be quiet about this? There is a canonical penalty. Okay. Uh, that the church can impose. Wow. And the more serious the papal uh, secret, uh, as they call it, yeah. uh, the more serious the penalty would be um, for lifting, for, for breaking it. Yeah, so, for example, cases. they use it when they go through a cause for canonization of a saint. Okay. You know, and so as they're going through and they find out this person wasn't quite as saintly as everyone thought, they don't <laughs> put that out in a newspaper. <laughs> he, was still, he was still a good priest or a good layperson, a good uh, laywoman, right. layman. Right, right. But, not um, but so it's, it, what it's trying to find. Um, are these qualities, and if, if the qualities aren't there, then the process just ends. Um, I'm never notified. No one's Nobody notified. Nobody knows. No one knows, know. right, that they look through it. Um, once then, so once those names would go to the nuncio, then they would send out those questionnaires uh, to all sorts of people who would know me, not just priests, uh, lay people as well, mm -hmm. obviously to my own bishop, other priests in the diocese, and then asking them, do you know some names of people who would know them well, who knew me well, who could give some more insight into, into my life? So they try to get a well-rounded picture of me. Just since you've been ordained or like your entire life? Because, I mean... So they want a variety. So they want people that I worked with, people that lived with me. To me, that's an interesting that question because I was all, friends with all of us, people. you know, who are, who are following Jesus have had conversion at some level. And so it's like, you know... You've gone through that conversion, you get into seminary, you discern with the church that you're called to be a priest, and maybe you've left a past behind. And, uh, well, it's an interesting point these you know, days. I mean, look at what's going on in politics and everything else. Yeah, you right. something all the way from like when you were you yeah. know, a teenager. No, I was very touched when our bishop, Bishop Kagan, had his press conference. It really touched me. I was in Helena at the time, and I listened to it after my own announcement uh, at the end when he uh, thanked me. Mm for my courage, just having the courage to say yes. And Absolutely. when I got Because you're under I, scrutiny, I, there's I, no doubt, right? I called him and I said, I, I didn't even think of that. Right. <laughs> because, you know, you become a more public person. Speak mm -hmm. a little bit about that. So you're chosen by the Holy Father. As you said, there's three candidates. He picks you and... So when this process is done, so they now have candidates, okay, that they think would be good candidates to become a bishop. Then it's about matching them with a diocese that would have particular needs that maybe this candidate's gift set will help uh, shepherd yeah. those yeah. people. Sure. And so when there's an opening, then they would start matching dioceses with these and it would then 
Uh, they would then recommend to the what's called the Congregation of Bishops, bishops and cardinals, that work at the pleasure of the Pope to make recommendations uh, mm -hmm. of which candidates around the world uh, should be bishops. So then, when they get the list, then that vetting process is all squeezed down and summarized, and then it, that's taken to the Holy Father uh, on Saturdays. They meet every two weeks, uh, the congregation, and then on Saturdays, the head of the congregation, Cardinal Ouellette, then meets with the Pope, and, uh, and they have he can choose, yep, he can choose the first one, the second one, the third one, he can reject them all. Um, so he can pick someone that's not even on the list. So the, what I was going to ask is simply that the the investigations never happened, that the, the con Congregation for Bishops did that. Are you saying that those, um, what do you call them, the, the letters, the, the document that asks about the person, uh, that that actually is done through the nuncio or the, yeah. the archdiocese or the nuncio, the nuncio is the representative of the Pope in the United States and is an archbishop himself in DC. Okay, and well, so it's his responsibility to help. All the mail goes. He's right collecting there. all of this. All right, he's wow, collecting. Okay. And so, then they're just gathering it together, taking what's common in each, finding out what's interesting, summarizing it all. Then the whole packet, I understand, and then a summary of it. Uh, would so would it be safe to say that every every bishop that's made in the United States goes through the nuncio in a very particular way? Yes, I would say. I, I mean, under say. the normal. Right. The Holy Father can choose anyone that yeah. he'd like. Think that's, that's interesting. I, but nonetheless, I think it's good for our, our viewers to understand, especially in the day and age that we're living in, that in fact there is a, a quite scrupulous process involved in mm -hmm. this. This isn't just random. It isn't who maybe the Pope or some bishop just likes that. Right. Uh, they sift through the candidates, do their due diligence, and who they're going to be assigning where, so we get the best man that we possibly can for the area. And, I mean, we're humans, so there's going to be flaws. I, yeah. I wouldn't have picked me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, the thing is, is that what, what's so important to remember in all of this um, is that God's a part of this. Yeah. Because well, we believe in the Incarnation and in the life of the Church, which is in history. It lives, the life of the Church lives in history. And so um, it's going to come through a very human-looking vehicle, right? But that we believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Vicar of Christ on Earth, that it also yes. is God Working has designed, drawings. has organized, has has set up the church, has instituted the church this way mm -hmm. to use our own human reason, our own human gifts, and then to trust that just as they chose the first one. After, uh, after the resurrection and uh, Judas uh, hung himself, that uh, Peter gathers them and says, we, we have to find a replacement. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they've been doing ever since, finding a replacement. For the next for the next for the next one mm -hmm. and so so that process comes to an end you've been selected and now what takes place it's interesting I want to go back when they when they chose Matthias it's very interesting if you see the criteria that they had for a bishop you had to be a witness of the resurrection a witness he had, of the resurrection he had to be with him his whole public life mm -hmm. right yep, and right. he was a man mm -hmm. and then they they then had two candidates and they chose lots, and they <laughs> said, okay, yeah. and they trusted that the Holy Spirit made his will known. Which he obviously did. In a, in a different way in the Acts of the Apostles, they, they explicitly say that at the uh, Council of Nicaea, or not Nicaea, of Jerusalem, in which they say it's the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us. Yeah. So they're, they're clearly aware that they are instruments of the Holy Spirit in a very... Uh, human decision that has to go on in terms of teaching the church, but also in choosing the, the next bishop. That there's real instrumental causality. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that we're not just sidelined. I love it when we're, we're not actually we're not making the, this up as we go along. I love that about the church. It's like when you get into these things, it might be foreign to the world as, as you know society exists today, but we're not making this up as we go along. This is the way the church was founded by Christ, and the apostles knew who they were. They knew what Jesus had given to them, mm -hmm. and they went out with that authority and with that that self awareness that we are we are carrying on the kingdom of God as Jesus has commanded us. And that belief in the church too, the the, the belief that it, you know it's part of our creed, which we pray every yeah. mass, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And the fact that the thing has been around for over two millennia and mm -hmm. it hasn't been destroyed yet mm -hmm. is clear proof, everyone, that the Holy Spirit is guiding it through this. Process. One thing that hit me very 
directly right after I was named is the, the passage in Scripture when Jesus comes down the mountain after praying and hundreds, thousands of disciples are there and then he chooses 12. Mm -hmm. And I just imagine them sitting on this hill and I'm like this and he walks down and he picks me and not you three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just happened actually. <laughs> and, and to see that that didn't destroy the church. That no, not they, at all. That they were chosen by Jesus because Jesus gets to choose. I gotta say, there's the joy of the Holy Spirit in this too. Tonight mm -hmm. we're uh, gathering at the University of Mary uh, for Bishop Elect Vetter's final farewell uh, from our brotherhood of the Presbyter and the Diocese of Bismarck, which is very close and one of the great blessings of this area. And I think some probably would maybe see this as, oh, well, one of the guys is elevated, maybe there's competition. And the gospel passage that comes to mind is when one is honored, we're all honored. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that there is so much joy over your elevation, the episcopacy, uh, that I think if anything could be described, it's a sadness of, of having you leave yeah, right. more exactly. than anything else, but we're so very proud of you. So, uh, you're chosen, and how do they get a hold of you? Well, they called, so I didn't answer the phone. I, it was a day off. I actually went to confession that day. Um, I tried to go every two weeks, and I was just praying and relaxing, watching some ESPN, catching up on some football, uh, and my bishop, Bishop Kagan, texted and said, give me a call. So I called him, and he said, did you receive any phone calls today? I <laughs> said, uh, yeah, a few. I said, he said, did you answer them? I said, no. I said, I mean, they were like every seven minutes. And uh, he said, what's the area code? I said, 202. He said, yeah, I would call that number back. <laughs> well, when I had looked in my phone log, uh, he had tried to reach me, the Archbishop, in the morning already. And I didn't call him back till 3.30. <laughs> and so I called and I said, I'm sorry, Archbishop. And uh, it was quite shocking when he answered the phone and said, this is Archbishop Pierre. And I said, oh, um, sorry, I didn't call you back sooner. <laughs> And we had a good laugh when I told him that I thought he was a telemarketer or trying to raise money. <laughs> he said, actually, no, I'm asking for something much more. Mm. And uh, asked if I was sitting down, if I was alone. And uh, he said, Pope Francis has named you the 11th Bishop of Helena. Mm. And then I was just silent. It felt like a lot longer than it was, I'm sure. And he said, do you accept? And I said, your grace and faith, yes. And we spoke about a few more matters. And after I hung up the phone, uh, I knelt down in my room. I didn't even come down to the chapel. I just knelt down in front of a crucifix and the Blessed Mother and just entrusted myself and said, uh, I've never looked for any of the assignments that I've ever had. Mm. And I just always tried to say yes. And so that's what I tried to do. I didn't have a good enough reason to say no. <laughs> if I had a good reason to say no, I would have said no. <laughs> but I didn't have a good enough reason. And so um, when I called him back, the nuncio's coming for the ordination. So when we set the date, uh, one thing that was very touching, I was hoping to have the announcement uh, public on the Feast of Our Lady the Rosary mm -hmm. on October 7th, but instead it was a day after, October 8th, and I was hoping for my ordination to be on November 21st, the Feast mm -hmm. of Our Lady the Presentation, but it ended up being a day early, and after I prayed uh, that afternoon, it just was very clear from Mary, the Blessed Mother saying, no, I got you right in my mantle. Right mm. before and right after, you're mm. right in the middle and of it. And it's those days in Europe anyway. No, so. that's right. So it was. It was <laughs> there you uh, go. Yeah. You're no, it's, it was really surreal. At the time, as it's happening, huh? You, you don't know which event or what words are being etched into your memory for the rest of your life. That's that's. Uh, it's just starting now. Uh, mm. As I s look back, and it's only been a month. Uh, a month tomorrow. Um, just how what things were really etched in of what clothes I was wearing, where I was standing when Burn I made the phone call, mind, yeah, you know, exactly. odd things like that, yeah. similar to any other family event. Right. Like your ordination. Yeah, ordination or when a couple right. gets married and she tells her husband that she's expecting a baby, where he was, the time of day it was, right. you know, all those things. Yeah. And so um, it's a very human thing. I told the cathedral today when I had the, the closing mass, I said, uh, I said, you know, this is for all of us to really see that the apostolic faith isn't just in Rome or in the Holy Land, it's right here in, in Bismarck, in the Diocese of Bismarck. I was out in little St. Michael's where I grew up, 35 families uh, for a Thanksgiving Mass out there. And I said, huh, we had no idea that you were raising a successor to the apostles. 
Yeah. And it's, you just amazing. don't know that the same faith is still And you're our same. first. We, we've had a bishop before, the Diocese of Bismarck before. He was born in Minnesota. So Bishop Elect Better is our first from here. And my classmate, and I couldn't be prouder of him. Yeah, thank you. It's great. It is a magnificent day here in the Diocese of Bismarck, and we are moving on now to the actual scoring of our port wine brought by Monsignor Schumacher, and it is Firehouse Winery in Rapid City, Correct. South Dakota. We want to thank them, and if Firehouse, if you're watching, uh, you have a magnificent wine, and we want to encourage uh, people to become a member of your winery so that they can get this delicious port shipped to them. It's a cold fall day here in Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, with the fire blazing, and I'm telling you, this wine is hitting the spot. Like I said, I've had a little bit of, a little cold. I'm speaking tonight on Bishop Alex's behalf, and it's opening up the vocal cords, to say the least. So, let's begin with the color, color. gentlemen. I'm uh, dark ruby red. Almost brown if there's enough in your glass, so it, it's a I think I might just very, very just dark. Tish more. Yeah. Caramel, almost. There's a little light there. Mm -hmm. Deep. It's a very deep, deep, deep ruby port, yeah. as opposed to a tawny, remember, which is more amber mm -hmm. in color. Uh, I don't know if anybody else tasted this, but I, I felt like there was some apricot moving on to the aromas uh, and, and the, 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 bou the bouquet in the palate. Like I said, I don't drink a lot of port, but every time I do drink port, I always get brown sugar in the nose. Maybe even almost like a crystallized brown sugar, like you're yeah. thinking... Uh, 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 creme brulee, you know, mm -hmm. maybe they burn it, kind of comes yeah. off real sweet. I always get chocolates. Yeah, and chocolates and definitely there. And brandy, candies. you got to remember your the, the brandy hits you, so you got to kind of d sift through that for mm -hmm. for the other. Beautiful yeah. smell though. It's not if you haven't case. had a port before. You're not like getting into a cab. You're not going to be doing a Bordeaux. Uh, you know, even some of the Spanish wines. This is a heavier wine. It's way more condensed, you know, maybe even like a caramel apple. Yeah, well, I'm it's thinking maybe out. vanilla, vanilla. Hints of vanilla from the French. I, I would, what, what, what's our, uh, what's our, what's our points in the aromas? A total of... For the, uh, it's out of 1 to, one to 15. I'm going to say it's a little bit lighter in the aromas, but it's, it's definitely there and I think it's complex. I'm going to have to give it a, a 13. Yeah, I would say that's fine. Anybody else? It's it's a port, so it's, it's, it's not going to be a yeah a, a very. But it's floral. distinct, you know. It it's is. not like a lot of floral. But I'm saying for a port wine, it's it's light, it's distinct, it's complex. I don't think I want to give it a 15 just because it's not there quite enough. I wish I had a little bit more, um, but it's it's definitely. Color distinct. score is 15. I think that's because it's port. Yeah, I don't think you're ever going to have a port that you're going to taste and say this is going to be good with a steak. Right, right, you don't, right. You don't right, right, drink exactly. port with steak. <laughs> it's right. a, after mm -hmm. dinner drink, so yeah. it's, yeah. it's made for some Perhaps a cigar. Right. Yeah, yeah. A cigar. Yeah. And dessert. Mm -hmm. yep. On to the taste. As a fortified, it's got you know a little bit more residual sugar. Although it's only 8%. Mm -hmm. So you taste that Syrah grape, which brought forth the brandy. Yep. So you got it, you got the Marquette grape, which is a hybrid. You got the Syrah. Tart. It is. It's tart. dry. It's dry. It's dry. And Syrah on our, several of our shows, mm -hmm. uh, it seemingly is the grape that we always end up tasting yeah. in some way or another. We have been sent bottles. People have gifted us bottles, and at the end we're like, "There's got to be Syrah in this." And lo and behold, in the blend, there's Syrah. So I, I'm getting some of that pepper, mm -hmm. just a real light pepper, the tartness. Uh, what was it like? The, the cherry. Yeah, and black cherry. Black, black cherry, 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 black cherry, black currant, cherry, black cherry, black currant, and then I'm I, yeah. I that sweet flavor underneath for me is definitely chocolate. Mm -hmm. Anybody else get yeah. a chocolate? Oh, yeah. It's a medium bodied, I think. Oh yeah, I mean, I've, I've had some ports heavy. that are like chewy, but this is not that. This is uh, a little bit more clean in, in the mouth feel, and I would say it's medium bodied, but not really getting any minerality off of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it is. I agree. Uh, very, very distinct from a tawny, yeah, and and a rosé, and, that's and, and of course a white yeah. or a sherry, yeah, with mm -hmm. no. But you guys really obviously have more experience with this than I do. But I like this one. I have to say, there's a lot. Maybe I've just been drinking too many tawnies, because it's so many times they're just like mm -hmm. you know, I had a big meal, we've had a few glasses of wine, and then you come rolling into this just thick thing. But it's like mm -hmm. I'd almost little Monte Negro Scotch. You know, something to kind of cut through all that. Tell me a little bit about the tannic quality. 
How do we feel about tannins? I think the tannins are low. Yeah, and, and, and the Mark Keck grape is known for that. Okay. Really? Yeah. Uh, I gotta do some research. They, 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 uh, the Firehouse Brewery also and, and Winery Real, they, they also have a, a wine called All American, which is which is just with the Marquette grape, and and that that should maybe be uh, contrasted to this. Well, okay. Uh, all, let's see. All we'll look it up. Called yeah. All American. Okay. It's, so it's, it's their Marquette wine. What do we want to give the taste? I love it. I think we we'll let is, you guys go. Yeah, it, this it, is uh, under twenty-five. You know, it kind of hits the spot now. You know, we yeah. I did. We I think we all just kind of drove in. I think we had lunch maybe an hour ago yeah. or, or so, and it, it's kind of hitting the spot right now. It is. You you, you don't want to you don't want to uh, drink this when you're hungry, right? Uh, and you don't want to drink it maybe too soon after a meal. We, we you know it's mid afternoon here, and it's for me it's kind of hitting the spot during the time of day. Mm -hmm. Out of a twenty-five, yeah. I'm I'm happy to give this uh, even a. I think it's great. I think a 24. I think. Yeah, I was going to say 20 or higher. Yeah. I think it's 20 or 24 higher. 24 it is. Add it up. What's our final score? O overall quality. Well, overall quality. It's fresh. It's clean. When, that's full point. So we're looking at 10, 25. A little bit of suspense here. Yeah. Yep. The drum roll for Firehouse. We're giving it, we're wine. Giving it a total of 96 points. It gets a 96, everyone. That's very high. Yeah, fourth, That's very high. Six. Good. We want to thank you for being with us on Two Priests and a Bottle of Wine. We've had Bishop Elect Austin Vetter heading to the Diocese of Helena explaining uh, how one becomes a bishop and the feelings on being a bishop. We congratulate you. Congratulations. Very Monsignor good. Pat Schumacher of Dickinson St. Wenceslas bringing Firehouse Wine Port in for us, which has been absolutely magnificent. We thank both of you it's gentlemen for being on the show. Thanks. We look forward someday, hopefully, to having Maybe. you back. Uh, until then, I'm Father Justin Waltz. And I'm Father Jaden Nelson. And we're two priests and, and a bottle of wine. wine.